Uh, I hope that you are challenged by today. I hope that there is some novelty in today. And what I mean by that is that your eyes might actually be open to God's Word and the truth that He has for us and how His Word impacts our lives. This book is incredibly, incredibly relevant to our day and age. And I'm especially excited about this talk. If I had to pick one favorite subject, it would be this one. So today we're talking about God's kingdom, what that is, where it is, and how in the world does that apply to us here and now. So I want, you to, uh, I want to ask you to imagine with me for just a moment, okay? So put on your vision glasses, your vision goggles. The younger you are, maybe the easier this is, okay, for those of us who are maybe tiptoeing into a little bit older age. Let's work really hard and imagine really hard with me for just a second, okay? Imagine that heaven comes down to earth, all right? Imagine that it is descending down on your spaces, your work, your house, the places you play, the places you eat, the places you walk your dog. Imagine that heaven comes down. If you need to close your eyes and imagine that, feel free to. But I want you to take special note of what is different now that heaven has gained, came down to your real life spaces. All right? You got a couple notes? Put a pin in that. We're going to come back to that here in just a moment. So today's text is going to be taken from Re Revelation 21. So if you want to open your Bible, we'll also have the words on the screen. Revelation 21. We're going to be starting in verse 1. This is a picture of heaven. All right? A man named John had a vision. He wrote all of those things down. This is what he wrote down of his vision of heaven. Revelation 21, starting in verse 1. We're going to read five verses together. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Love verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. That's John's vision of an eternal, eternal heaven. Now, it sounds like a pretty amazing place, right? There's no crying. There's no mourning. There's no grieving. There's no death. There's no cancer. There's no bad hospital reports. There's no more month left at the end of your money. There's no cranky crying kids. There's no fighting siblings, right? Am I, are you starting to catch my drift? This is a pretty awesome place. There's no neighbors who are mad at each other. There's no co-workers. There's no fighting on the basketball field or the football field. It's a place of bliss and eternal paradise, this heaven that we read about in Scripture. Now, it sounds awesome, but it sounds way out there. It sounds far from our current reality, doesn't it? Because you're probably thinking, as I was reading this, this sounds awesome. This is not my life. I wouldn't use these words to describe my life. You know, in uh, our world, the temporal world, we see quite the opposite. We see hurt feelings. We see people getting angry. Sadness because of deep loss 
and uh, bad reports on this side of eternity's grandpa's passed away. It's a sad reality. It's a broken paradise. God created Eden, a place of, the word literally translates delight, and he set the world in motion, a place where he would dwell with man and woman. And paradise was fractured because of Adam and Eve's decision to step into sin. Adam and Eve decided, I'm going to choose my way instead of God's way. And when sin entered, paradise fractured. Think about it this way. You ever seen one of those shatterproof glasses that break? Like, you're right, it doesn't shatter. It doesn't like land on you if it doesn't, but... It's shattered, right? It looks like a giant spider web, and you can't see through it when a glass like that breaks. It's a fracturing. Our world is a paradise fractured. God created us to be with him forever. And one day, those who have repented of sins and confessed with their mouth that Jesus is Lord will be reunited with him again in an Eden type of scenario. Paradise restored. But until then, you and I live in a broken world. I like to draw. I brought a marker board to help illustrate these two circles. For today's purpose, are going to represent heaven. And this one is going to represent earth. Heaven and earth. We just read about heaven. We just described earth. Two very different places. However, I want to draw a second diagram where heaven and earth overlap. Why would I draw this? Why is this relevant to our life? Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is going to help explain this overlap. Ephesians 1 and 7 because it has great relevancy to your life. And to my life. Ephesians chapter 1. There it is. Starting in verse 7. In him. What's the him? The him is Jesus. In Christ. We have redemption. Through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses. According to the riches of of grace. Let me pause right there at the end of verse 7. In Christ, if you are in Christ, you are reconciled to God. God who is perfect and holy and just. Us who are not, we have sinned, we are broken, marred vessels. In Christ, we are brought together with God. He's the reconciliation. How? Because Jesus, God's only son, lived a perfect life and died a terrible death. And if you and I place our trust in him, he brings us together with God. That is the reconciliation of Jesus. That's what we have in Christ. That's what verse 7 explains. Verse 8, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his, God's purpose, which he set forth, here it is again, in Christ. That's a big deal. Look at verse 10. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. In Christ, heaven meets earth. If you are in Christ, you have a part to play in the redemption between God and humanity. In Christ. Now let's get practical with this, because this is real heady theological stuff we're floating around in right now. I love telling this story because it makes all of this kind of come to earth for me. Uh, I have a friend, he's here this morning, his name's Paul. Paul did a really nice thing for me years ago, and although I was not a top-selling uh, ISR rep for HP, he invited me to go with those people who worked at that company to Dallas for a really fun 48-hour weekend in Dallas, and on that trip, we rode this 
awesome like stretched black bus and they lead they led us into Cowboy Stadium through the tunnels and then we got to walk out onto the turf like Cowboys turf uh, yes I know it's not the 90s anymore and the Cowboys are no longer dominant it doesn't matter that was my childhood just let me live in it for just a moment and so we walked out onto the football field and we had a football and we got to throw a pass into the end zone and uh, here are these folks, it wasn't a game, but it was cool because we were on the field. And Paul does this thing where he looks at a security guard. I'm standing with him. I mean, it's him and I on the field. He looks at the security guard like there was this moment in time, like straight from the scene of a movie. And he gives this like nod, like you know what's up, but I don't know what's up. And the security guy gives the nod. And then all of a sudden, Paul points overhead. And on, at the time, maybe still, the world's largest screen is this logo over our heads at AT AT&T Stadium. I literally, yes, that's the appropriate reaction, I literally spit my drink. It's the only time that's ever happened in my life because I was so blown away in that moment. And I had so many questions. First of all, how did you do this? Now, he wouldn't answer them, and that made the, the moment even cooler for me. Uh, But also, why would you do this? And Paul said something to me that I think about often. He said, you said in a sermon one time that God's kingdom was anywhere that Christ was king, right? And I said, yeah, I think I said something like that one time. And he goes, well, that means right now we're standing in God's kingdom. Now, Cowboys football aside, what Paul was saying was because Paul and I were following Jesus... And that Paul lived, or sorry, that Jesus lived in Paul and I. That we were walking and the kingdom of God was anywhere that we were. You see how this works? When Christ is king of your heart and life, you bring the kingdom of God with you everywhere you go. Even if that's Dallas Cowboys Stadium, and this was just a tiny way to illustrate that, tiny way to illustrate that in that moment. If you're a child of God, you are walking in the light of God's kingdom. And that should bring joy to your mind, body, and soul. That is powerful. We also stuck an X sticker on that. On, um, let's go to the next slide. Darren McFadden's locker. It's about eight feet in the air. I had to jump to do it and to take a picture. So I'm hoping it's still there. Please don't tell anybody. Let's pull the slide. Okay. So... If anywhere we go as followers of Christ, we bring God's kingdom with us, let me ask you this question. Where's your garden? Where's the area that God has given you to cultivate? Where's your garden? For Adam and Eve, it was Eden. For you, it's the places that you live, work, and play. And I would propose to you today that God has given you your garden with the purpose of cultivating it for his glory. So that his name and renown can be told among the generations. So I brought yet another picture. A topological picture of my garden. This is my neighborhood. And the president of my HOA informed me this week that there's 266 houses in my neighborhood. Uh... Why does that matter? Because this neighborhood is the garden that I have the responsibility of tending. The reason I wanted to show you this is because I'm hoping that God gives you a picture today of your garden. Whether it's the apartment complex that you live in, the student hall that you live in, the neighborhood that you live in, the place you work, the place you play, the place you frequent, the coffee shops you go to, the shopping malls that you visit, the places you go... Are God's calling, God is calling you to go in those places in light of his kingdom and to bring Jesus into those places. So this is my garden. I can point to you on this picture where my house is. I can show you uh, on the street uh, the place where uh, Nathan and Christina live. The place where uh, Daniel and Mary live. uh, The place where Nina and Parag live live, the place where R.L. and Ashley live, the place where Kurt and Beth Ann Shunky live, the house that's currently for sale on my street, if you're looking for a place. The whole point of this is that 
God wants us to cultivate the places we live. How do we do that? Well, let me give you just some really simple ways from our lives since moving to this place a few years ago. One is when COVID hit, do you remember the hot commodity that was toilet paper? Well, we found a bunch. Actually, Whitney, who lives with us, found a bunch on the shelf, and she brought a bunch home. And so we took it house to house uh, to neighbors. It would, you would have thought we were delivering bars of gold. There are a couple neighborhoods, uh, uh, neighborhood restaurants on that map. We do our best to frequent those neighborhood restaurants. We try to learn the cashier's name. We try to learn our waiter and waitress's name. We try to tip well. We try to be good stewards of what God has given us by building friendships in our neighborhood. We often attend holiday parties in our neighborhood. We try our best to treat everyone in our domains with dignity and respect. Uh, along with pastoring, I also own a small business. It is my responsibility as a follower of Christ uh, to treat those that I do business with, that I interact with, with kindness, with respect, with dignity, with care. The same way that I would treat those in my own household. See, we cultivate our domains. It starts in our home, and it works outward, and it touches every facet of our lives. And let me just be up front. We don't always get it right. Most of the time, we get it wrong. But we try to be the first ones to apologize and ask for forgiveness. Because even the apology puts on Jesus for display for those around us to see. You see, God has given all of us spaces. Everything I just listed are things that are very available to you to do in your own lives. Uh, some of you in this room have very different roles. Uh, some of my, uh, I have some friends that lead an organization uh, that fosters Conway's newest growth initiatives. They're bringing, literally bringing business and jobs and employment to Conway so that people can make a living and provide for themselves, provide for their families, take an occasional vacation. They're helping generate jobs, stewarding land and promoting the well-being of our city by creating new parks for people to enjoy. And we've shared some very simple things that you can do to put the kingdom on display and some very uh, if God gives you the opportunity, some incredible city landscape shaping things, and all of us are somewhere in between, every one of us has a part to play in promoting God's kingdom in and around our city. Now, ultimately, all of these things that we've listed are not just opportunities or attempts to be philanthrop uh, philanthropic do-gooders. It's so much more than that. We want our neighbors, I want my neighbors to know Jesus Christ personally and the salvation and forgiveness of sin that he offers so that they can also live a life of freedom in Christ and purpose in their everyday. That's why I do this. This is why we do this. So where's your garden? So let's get to some specifics. So a year or so ago, I asked my friend Whitney Henderson, I said, if heaven came to earth in your neighborhood, what would look different? I love her answer. It was immediate. It was super simple and profoundly beautiful. She said, I think, I feel like all the neighbors would be out walking their animals, walking their dogs at the same time and being friendly to each other. And the more I thought about it, I thought, that kind of sounds like the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? Kind of sounds a little bit like Paradise Restored. I asked my friend Mark this question this week. I said, what would it look like if heaven came down and invaded your spaces? This is what Mark said. He said, I see, I, I, in visual, I in, envision darkness being pushed out of all of the spaces as light invades. Whoa. <laughs> I'm like, dude, chase that. <laughs> what, I mean, what better way to spend the rest of your life than pushing out darkness with the light of Jesus Christ? So when I said that earlier at the outset of this, what looked different? Think about that. What were your answers? Here's my encouragement. Go and do those things. Go and do those things. 
If heaven came to earth, there's probably some true universal principles. I was talking to Adam in, in my living room about this last night. He said uh, he talked about how people would walk at an average pace. There'd be no need for hurry in heaven. Why would you hustle? Why would you have to get out, up and slay the day if Jesus was king where you live, work, and play? Wouldn't need to. There'd be no crimes, right? Be safe. If you wanted to walk out your house at night, you need a you didn't need a big dog or a friend or a telephone, you just go and do it. If heaven came to earth, adults would dance like children. Freely, gracefully, without fear or shame. There'd be no guilt in our homes. There'd be no worry. <laughs> Why would we be afraid of what's out there? If Jesus was here, everything's taken care of, right? There'd be a high level of trust. I could talk openly to you about anything without fear or judgment. And you would return the favor with me. We'd trust one another. There'd be no fear in in occupation, career, business. We wouldn't have to worry about people taking advantage. If Jesus was here, everything's fine. Everything will be okay. Well, I got great news. The nature of the kingdom, although there is an element of it that is not yet, that's an eternity that awaits us one day in paradise, there's also an element of the kingdom that is here and now. Jesus announced declared, proclaimed the presence of his kingdom of light when he walked the earth. That was 2,000 years ago. His kingdom has been here ever since. You just have to look a little hard at this point in time because it's not yet been perfected. So what are we looking for? We're looking for the presence of Jesus in our hearts and lives. We're building relationships with others who are also walking in his presence. And the kingdom grows and goes when we operate in this way. This is how the kingdom works. So what did God put on your mind earlier when you envisioned heaven coming to earth? Here's your homework. Go and do those things. Put him on display for your co-workers. Treat someone with dignity who doesn't deserve it and watch what happens. Pray for a stranger. Care for the less fortunate. Man, the implications just in this room, as I've preached this morning, I've scanned the room, I see all of your faces. Just the implications of this lived out among these people would change our city. Nearly overnight, I'm convinced. There are so many pockets and people of, in, of influence in this room right now. And before you try to write yourself off, let me just remind you that God often used the least likely for the most significant places of change. Well, my life is quiet. I don't know anybody. That's not true. My life doesn't matter. No one sees me. That's not true. I see you right now. God sees you in every moment. Think about this for a moment. Imagine the impact. As organizations like Kayla through Deliver Hope, Micah Ribbing, who, by the way, is hiring, looking for a part-time job. Saw that on Facebook. If you're interested, see Micah and Kayla. Ministering to at-risk teens. Um, unwed young moms. Giving them life skills regularly. It's the kingdom of God. Organizations like Bethlehem House. TJ, sitting right back here. He's championing the cause to care for homeless and hurting people in our city. It's beautiful. You want to see the kingdom? Go out to lunch with TJ. Watch what happens. We could go on and on. The Conway Chamber of Commerce. Promoting businesses and bringing income producing jobs into our city. So that people can have a quality of life. That's kingdom work. That's kingdom advancing work. Some of you are volunteers at the Boys and Girls Club. You're going after school. You're engaging in programs 
for kids that really don't have anything to do or places to go after school before their parents get home. And you're engaging them with meaningful activity and you're building relationships. And in doing so, you're revealing the person, love, grace, kindness of our master to many who are watching. We have realtors in this room who are helping uh, singles, who are helping families find places to call their own. To build spaces of rest. And care. Places where others will come and receive encouragement. Maybe even hear the, the, about the gospel for the first time. Business owners. CEOs in this room. Who are working in the marketplace. Touching lives every day that will not in un, any other environment hear or get an opportunity to witness the love of Christ by the way that they interact with them. Construction workers in this room who are delivering clean water to homes throughout Faulkner County and beyond. Sanitation workers who are helping provide for the cleanliness of our city, caring for our waste and garbage. Electricians who are helping deliver electricity to, to fuel your uh, microwaves and your TVs and your uh, heaters at your house to stay warm in the winter. Don't you, don't you see? It's all kingdom work. And the way we do it matters. Stay-at-home moms who are investing in the future of our world one tiny life at a time even when it feels like you're losing 90% of the time. Coaches. Coaches who are impacting players. And it's so much bigger than the sport they play. They're imparting wisdom and truth and discipline into their lives that will help them be successful in every facet of life as they continue to grow. Teaching responsibility. And even sharing the good news of Jesus with time to time with their players. Musicians who are creating art through sound. Creating experiences where others can close their eyes. Listen as the art reflects the beauty and the grace of the greatest artist creator that ever lived, God Yahweh himself, reflections of that beauty. Athletes who regardless of what you do, or what sport you play, or the activities you gauge in, have an opportunity to showcase the glory and majesty, the endurance of a God who endures don't you see it's all tied together? God has called all of us to his grand story of redemption as heaven comes closer and closer to earth. We had a night of worship a couple years ago in my home and one of the musicians prayed at the close of that prayer. God, would you just make the streets of our city into pure gold? And I was like, that's it. That's it. This is what it looks like. As we move, as heaven moves closer to us and we usher in the presence of Christ with everyone we come in contact with, Conway starts to look more like heaven. How do I? I'm a very visual person. I imagine Robinson Avenue, pure gold. Mitchell Street, pure gold. In 2013, when my wife and I and two children moved to Conway, I drove down Prince Street for the first time, traveling east. And on my left was a behemoth of a high school. And it was so overwhelming. It had just been finished pretty soon before that. And I felt the Spirit of God impress on my heart. That school, the culture, the climate of that school is going to be different because I called you to this city. And by the time your children graduate, the climate, the spiritual climate of that school will be different because my kingdom would be nearer and nearer. 
as you continue to go and share this message and watch this ripple effect invade our neighborhoods, our marketplaces, our restaurants, our ball fields, and even the walls, the halls of our high school. By the way, everything that I've shared this morning was very near to the heart of Jesus. And so I'd like to finish our time together by reading the Lord's Prayer. We learned this on our high school baseball team. I didn't understand it at the time, but the coach was putting something, he was searing something into our conscience. And that I'll remember it forever. We're going to put it on screen, and I would like for you to read it with me. Okay? These are... Uh, This is Jesus teaching his closest friends, his followers, his disciples to pray. And I want you to pay special attention to the words that you're sharing in this prayer. Okay, let's read this together. Then, pray then in this way. Here it is. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Would you stand and pray with me as we close? Lord, thank you for meeting us here. Your spirit is so clearly working in this room. Lord, I pray for every heart, mind, and soul in this place, those viewing online. God, with this message of your kingdom that you came to announce permeate the very streets, the very fabric of the city in which we live. And we pray this in the precious, holy, and powerful name of Jesus. Amen.